Hello, welcome. I'm Penny Thornton and I'm talking astrology, talking specifically on this video about the full moon in Aquarius set to occur on the 24th of July 2021. Now, of course, I'm going to be talking about a lot of other things as well because a full moon or a new moon uh, never happens in isolation. There's always lots of other things going on in the cosmos, lots of other alignments, and they make quite a difference. I mean, one full moon in Aquarius isn't the same as another full moon in Aquarius. And while we're on the subject of Aquarian full moons, we've actually got two uh, in this 28-day period. Um, the, the second one will be on the 22nd of August. Now, because of this, and I'll give you some scientific background here, um, there will be four full moons between the summer solstice, which was on the 21st of June, and the autumn equinox, which happens on the 21st of September. And because there are four, it means that there's a blue moon, and this is technically the one in August, is going to be a blue moon. So we've got two ways of looking at it uh, scientifically, and also it's got a, a name. Well, well, the full moon that we're coming up to on the 24th of July, that's called the Blueberry Moon, which is rather nice and reminds us that certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, um, it's a high summer and the berries are ripening. And uh, whether you're in Sweden and it's lingonberry season, or whether you're in America or in uh, Greece, wherever you may be, it's berry season. Now, this full moon being in Aquarius brings out the theme of Aquarius. Remember, the moon is about uh, feelings. It's about uh, instincts and reflection. You know, the moon, we, we only see the moon because it's reflected by the sun's light. Um, and so it is a, an astrological principle of reflection. And I think one of the things we should all get in the habit of doing every full moon is to think back over the previous month and certainly the previous couple of weeks and reflect on the events that have happened, the key events, and figure out how we feel about everything. And because, of course, a full moon is about endings, um, it's a good time to figure out what we need to set aside and say is done and dusted so that we can start a new chapter on the next new moon, clean and clear. Now, Endings really are a theme of any full moon. Um, but sometimes that has a rather negative um, aura to it. The idea of endings always seem to be sad, unless you put the word happy in front of it, you get a happy ending. Um, but really and truly, I like to use the word conclusions for a full moon because you can reach conclusions on a full moon. And that means you can reach understandings, whether that means you just discover yourself, how you feel about something, or you make some other kind of discovery, or it could mean that you reach an understanding with someone else or a whole lot of other people. So that's a very positive theme with every full moon. Of course, full moons always up the emotional ante. So we do tend to feel a little bit more emotional at full moon. Sometimes that's a good thing because um, when our hearts are full, full of happiness, then that full moon can make it such a joyous experience. But of course, if we're really miserable and crying into our soup, then that full moon is going to make us cry even more. So there are always extremes with a full moon. Um, but looking at this idea of Aquarius, I mean, usually there's just, well, of course, you always get um, two full moons in a year that are in the same sign. And on this occasion, as I've mentioned before, it's, it's in Aquarius. Um, but really and truly, a full moon in uh, throughout the year, throughout the 12 months and the 12 houses of your um, solar chart and your natal chart means that you get a full moon in each house roughly every month. And that means that the affairs of that house, the things that we associate with that house, whether it's the second house or the eighth house, so a full moon on that axis, we're always talking about money, closing deals, coming to understandings about money. But sometimes, of course, we get financial crises if we've got a full moon on our second eighth axis. 
And of course, you could have a full moon perhaps in your um, 11th house, which I'm going to be talking about shortly, which brings you fairly and squarely into the world of Aquarius and things to do with the group mind, group consciousness, the collective. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but, you know, particularly for Leo and Aquarius, this full moon is ultra important because, um, well, but for several reasons. Um, for Leo, we look at the sun in your sign and the moon in the opposite sign. And when we look at the full moon itself, you know, we're, we're looking really at things to do with relationships and, uh, you know, the relationship axis is involved. And often that means it's time to make a decision based on your emotions and feelings about a relationship. And really the same is true of Aquarius as well. We've got that kind of axis going for us, you know, relationship axis. And it's a time to say, look, let's do the deal. Or, you know what, we are done here. <laughs> One of the two. Um, but we also look particularly, I think, at uh, Taurus and Scorpio, two of the other fixed signs, and a full moon on um, the 10th, 4th house axis is very important for these two signs. So in Taurus's case, we've got the sun at the very base of the chart and the area of home and family, your ancestors, your roots of life, the base of operations, the foundations of the future. And we've got uh, the moon in the area of uh, our place in the world which can be marked by the job we do, or in some way, just by the social um, aspects of who we are and, our, and that kind of aspect of our existence. So a full moon often comes um, to close a deal in the same way as it does with a, a relationship, but that may be more to do with a job or a house, for instance, that you're ready to you know, um, exchange contracts or reach completion, as we say, in the UK. And the reverse is also pretty well the case with uh, Scorpio, only for Scorpio, the moon is in the fourth house and the sun is in the 10th house. And while the sun is moving through Leo and the 10th house, it becomes a really important time to kind of get your uh, space in order in the sense of, you know, what you really want to achieve in life and what are your main goals. And that might mean, you know, throwing out a few plans and putting in some new ones, talking to people, authority figures, bureaucrats, whatever it takes to put some important plans in place. And of course, it may turn out that at this time, um, you know, you also perhaps reach the end of a job or the end of a situation that's associated with your long term plans. Really, for um, a Taurus, it's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of different. And we have the emphasis really on the home itself, because the sun is moving through that area. Lots of things to do with family, whether that's family gatherings and, uh, you know, family issues or whether you're talking bricks and mortar. So there's a lot of uh, painting and decorating and uh, changes going on within your four square walls. Whether, you know, you're really ready to move on, end a chapter for family life. So I think always for the... Um, the signs of the, uh, you know, whatever modality that you belong to, cardinal, fixed or mutable, whenever you get a full moon in, you know, two of those uh, uh, modalities, then they're going to affect the other two as well. And that's always just a good thing to remember for some general kind of tips about astrology, full moons, that kind of thing. But of course, all of us have Aquarius somewhere in our charts. And when the full moon is in Aquarius, we do get a really kind of, um, uh, it, it, it's like on stereo. <laughs> do we still have stereos? But you know what I mean, supersonic sound, Aquarius. And all the properties of Aquarius speak to us loudly and clearly. I don't like to think of um, uh, the Aquarian energy being particularly strong because I think the moment we start thinking of astrology and energies, we're into very dangerous waters. And we don't really want to do that. But we probably want to think about the principles of Aquarius. And Aquarius is the most humanitarian of the signs. It's a, a sign that um, uh, is objective and detached from the emotions, uh, simply because in order to get to the truth, you need to 
you know, take emotions out of the equation sometimes. And of course, it's also the sign of brotherhood. It's a sign of the community. It's, a, well, I said earlier, it's the, the sign of the group mind. So for all of us with, um, you know, this moon in Aquarius, it is encouraging us to really focus on the power of the group as opposed to our individual efforts and our individual mind. I mean, sometimes when I'm working with couples in astrology and they're in a tough place, they're not doing well, They've both got their reasons for why they're not very pleased with each other. And one of the ways I get them to come together is to talk about them being part of a team. Uh, you know, whether that's uh, Team Sussex or Team Johnson or Team Thornton. You know, as a part of a team, if you pull together with a common goal, you're going to be stronger. And often working together for that common objective brings you together and overcomes all those things that are sort of causing a lot of kind of pain and upset in the relationship. And I think in general, let's just take it out of the area of one-on-one -on -one relationships and think about what this moon in Aquarius encourages, encourages us to be and do, is to call on the group, is to canvas opinion, is to figure out how we can come together for a common purpose and to do things more effectively. And my goodness, wouldn't that be a good thing if we could do that as the world we live in, as humanity coming together with a common goal? Of course, eventually we'll have to because of climate change, but it would be a good idea if we could come together at this point. And I think a lot of the things that have been happening, really, I think since, well, it's probably even before the sun, uh, kind of um, enters Leo. It's been there while the sun is in Cancer as well, because we've had this big dynamic um, triggered by Mars and Venus. And by the time we get to early August, the sun and Mercury will be doing the same thing. And that really is bringing into mind the struggles we have as nations, as individuals working with each other, and how we need to abandon certain um, practices and belief systems in order to be more prepared for the future. So it's a big theme playing, and it's actually a really big Aquarius theme. America has its uh, moon in Aquarius, its natal moon. It was born, it became uh, its, uh, an entity with a moon in Aquarius. And so with two full moons in Aquarius in these next 28 days, then really we are looking at the voice of the people. That's exactly what the moon in Aquarius represents. And so I suspect that a lot of things will be coming to a head and the people will be, well, let's hope they'll be combining to get their message across. Now, let's have a look at uh, this uh, full moon in the astrology. Let's have a look at it in our horoscope. Now, as you can see, um, I've set this for Stockholm, and that's not only because I love Stockholm, I have a home in Stockholm, and Sweden is very special to me, but of course, the long summer you know, days, the, the nights that are so brief, they're almost not night at all. And so here we have the sun rising at uh, 4.38 in the morning. And if we look at the circle of the horoscope and we look at our left hand point, the horizon, the nine o'clock position, if it were a clock, we see the sun there rising. And if we flip over to the opposite side of the chart, we see the moon in Aquarius just sort of setting. So that gives you a picture of what that full moon is about. And it's in the very first degree of Leo, uh, Leo Aquarius. So if you have something in your chart that's about one degree of the fixed signs, that's Taurus, Scorpio, Leo and Aquarius, then this full moon is going to close something for you. It's going to be the end of something, but let's talk about happy endings, Let's talk about reaching conclusions. But I also want to look at some other things in this chart while we have it up in front of us. And just prior to the, uh, to the full moon, we have Venus entering the sign of Virgo. Um, if you see here, it's just in about the um, eight o'clock position on the clock face. Uh, Venus in green there, um, in early Virgo. 
with Venus in Virgo, for Virgos in particular, it's almost like you have a kind of extra special something. It doesn't mean you're going to be the luckiest you've ever been or you're going to fall madly in love and have everything come to you that you've ever wanted. But it does set the stage and it creates an atmosphere in in which you can be successful and you can achieve your ends. And if you look at the horoscope here, if we look at the exact opposite point to Venus, we see the planet Jupiter, because yes, there's a Venus-Jupiter opposition just before we get to um, the full moon. And that's often a very romantic and very kind of buoyant um, sort of aspect. We should have some good financial news, not necessarily each one of us personally, but generally the uh, kind of mood the financial mood, the optics, the financial optics are going to be pretty good. And we might hear about people getting married and maybe some celebrity developments and romances that might be sort of interesting. That's if you're interested in that kind of frivolous stuff rather than the kind of deep astrology that perhaps we should be really focusing on um, in this uh, video. So just as a point, the sun's arrival in Leo, you might like to uh, make a note of that because it arrives in Leo on the 22nd of um, July at uh, 1428 UTC. So any babies born before that time are still going to be Cancerians and any babies born after that point are going to be little lions. Now, on the 28th of, uh, of July, Jupiter turns retrograde. And I'm going to come away from the uh, horoscope now and, and talk to you a little bit about that. Because it, this is very interesting. When um, no, Jupiter doesn't turn retrograde, let me rewind. <laughs> Jupiter is retrograde, but what it, it is doing is heading back into Aquarius. It's been out of Aquarius for uh, two or three months. And so it's now going back into that sign. And of course, we talk about shadow periods and I'm very interested in the idea of a shadow period because from the moment a planet turns retrograde and then heads back over ground it's already covered, it'll go back to a certain point where it was a certain degree. And in the case of Jupiter, we're talking about 22 of Aquarius it's got to get back to. Well, during the time it's going back through this uh, through the sign of Aquarius, is going to be picking out certain events and experiences and thoughts and developments and issues that were around in the period, really, around the March, sort of April time, that kind of period. And what a retrograde planet allows us to do, particularly in Jupiter's case, is that it allows us to reconsider, review, and perhaps in some instances to really rework something. So by the time uh, Jupiter turns direct, which it will do on October the 20th, starts going back over the, that same ground again, but in direct motion, then things can really be signed and sealed and done. That's it. That whole process that Jupiter has taken you through, and it really does depend where Jupiter is transiting in your chart as to the area of life and the themes that that's going to bring you. But the idea that Jupiter goes back into Aquarius on the 28th could be very important, especially if you are born at the end of your sign. So that means you're born, you know, towards about the 19th of February, the 18th or 19th of February. Now, if we get to the 29th of the month, Mars, uh, currently in uh, Leo, will be opposing Jupiter. And again, that's a rather buoyant kind of uh, influence. And if you listen to what I'm saying and really hear it, you can hear a theme coming through, can't you? You can hear a theme of much more optimistic kind of, uh, more kind of um, joyous experiences. Now, it doesn't mean every single aspect of our life is going to be perfect, perfect, perfect. But the, the mood, the, the kind of atmosphere around things is definitely a lot more upbeat. And I think that's also something to bear in mind because really the start to July with the Mars Saturn opposition, the Mars during a square followed by Venus in the same position was really grim for a lot of us. There was a lot of unrest 
a lot of troubles and a lot of events that happened that were really, truly shocking. And, um, you know, we've got to assimilate all that. But having a look at our new moon, our full moon chart and the things that are going on around that time, we can really see how much more buoyant things are. But hold your horses. <laughs> Isn't it always the same? You know, I talk about um, a horoscope uh, and astrology really being like a game of snakes and ladders. You know, you go up some wonderful ladders and down some really dreary snakes. And so we've been up a ladder, so to speak, um, since about the 8th uh, of uh, July. And as we come into the very, very end of the month, so we are talking about the 27th, 28th, 29th, and certainly the 1st of August and right through from the 1st of August to the um, uh, 6th of August, we're back in that Uranus uh, Saturn territory. I'm going to come back and have a look at the chart again and, and show you what I mean. You see Mars there. We, we can see it just next to Venus. And when Venus and Mars together, that's quite a sexy combination. So some of you are feeling a little, a little antsy. <laughs> you know, Mars and Venus have got you by the tail. Um, but of course, Mars will go forward and, um, you know, will enter Virgo as well. But if we go back, we can see here, here is our Saturn in the seventh house of, uh, well, in this picture, it's in the seventh house, but it's in Aquarius. And uh, we can see Uranus right up there, the highest most planet up in the sign of Taurus, Saturn and Uranus continue to be in square. They're not as close as they were in mid-June. They're moving away from each other, but my goodness, they'll be back with a vengeance in November. And they certainly can't be discounted because, you know, as we'll see, as the sun in this picture, at one degree of Leo, well, it's going to reach the opposition to Saturn, um, you know, in that early part of August. And then we'll have Mercury following in its footsteps so that we have another kind of experience, a little bit like we had in the early part of July. It won't be an identical uh, experience, it never is, but um, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's going to bring out that Saturn-Uranus dynamic, which is really very difficult. We're continually running up against brick walls. Our plans meet with, well, not necessarily failure, but really obstruction. And so what we have to do is, you know, redouble our efforts and try something completely different because a new way is coming through, but we just haven't found it. And I've also talked, as you know, about uh, accountability and, uh, you know, the importance of taking accountability and uh, finding the release and freedom in that. And I think this came very much up into the conversation um, as We'll come back to me again. I think this came really back into the conversation um, towards the kind of in, in the early part of July uh, when Bill Cosby was uh, released from his jail sentence on a technicality. And of course, that was absolutely traumatic for the Me Too movement and for all those women, all 50 women who had accused him of sexual uh, misconduct. Um, and so it seemed as though, well, what's happening here? Where is the accountability that we're looking at, which is meant to be uh, taken in order for that release to happen? Well, that is what's in that event, if you like, because yes, um, in one way, we can look at the Bill Cosby situation and see that he did have to take accountability in terms of paying the price and going to prison. But is that enough? That's the relative safety of four square walls and coming out into the public eye where he will receive discrimination, uh, he will be rejected, he will find everything extremely tough. And that may be in some ways even harder. And wouldn't that be a wonderful moment to realize I should be taking accountability for this. I need to make an apology. So that's the kind of thing that's being urged and encouraged with this dynamic. It's not always going to happen because remember, we're human and we have free will. And also a lot of this applies to big national and international companies and political situations. And you know what that's like. It's all about money and power. And taking accountability is a little bit of a scary thing. 
So I'll leave that on one side now. And uh, I want to move um, just a little bit uh, further. Uh, and uh, there was something I didn't actually mention when I was looking at this uh, new moon, full moon situation. The first full moon in Aquarius taking place on the 24th of July and the second one on the 22nd of August. And, you know, I often kind of link the new moon in Aquarius or the new moon in Pisces, whatever it may be, to the full moon in that sign and say there is always a connection. There's always a resonance, an echo, a bounce about that kind of period. And uh, so we, we need to go back to about the 11th of February for that new moon in, in Aquarius to have some bounce when we come to the 24th of July, but because we have two full moons and the second full moon on the 22nd of August is much closer to the degree of the new moon, I think you're going to find that bounce, that echo, that kind of connection of events and experiences. It's going to be a little bit more profound by the time we come to the second full moon in Aquarius uh, later on in August. But I did bother to take a look at some of the events that happened on the 11th of February, that new moon in Aquarius. And we can look to see on either of these full moons, whether indeed that bounce came, we got a little bit more information or more development on that, or maybe it was a done deal. And we think particularly in uh, the Chinese mission to Mars, their uh, little spacecraft landed on Mars on the 11th. Uh, Meghan Markle won her case, her privacy case against the Mail on Sunday. Um, Joe Biden reversed Trump's order on the wall. You know, no more money to be spent on the wall. And perhaps most interesting of all, because it is such an Aquarian kind of um, uh, theme, is that the United Nations made a promise that it would prosecute, investigate, build cases against those who had uh, been criminally, uh, uh, who, 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 you know, done really, really difficult, bad things. God, I'm not saying this very well, Anna, but you know what I mean. Uh, human rights issues, those kind of things that the United Nations made a promise to prosecute internationally. So that might be something very interesting to watch as we look at these two full moons coming up. So closing. My closing argument, <laughs> my little conclusion, um, well, it is sort of centered on the idea of Aquarius and unity and the, um, the group as opposed to the individual. I mean, yes, we're all individuals. I mean, we have feelings and uh, sensibilities and interests uh, that are all uniquely us, and we care about them because we are an individual. But, you know, sometimes the group, the bigger picture, the larger entity is more important than us, than the, the little me and the little world that we inhabit. And I think that's really being encouraged here by well, two full moons in Aquarius. Let's put our little self aside and look at the bigger picture, the bigger self, the things that are more important for the group. And as I explained when I started the video to you, how I work with my couples sometimes and talk about being, you know, Team Sussex or Team Johnson. Um, that idea that we're stronger as a group, stronger as a team, and that sometimes we do have to sacrifice our opinions, our desires, uh, our ambitions, because it's a better thing we do for the greater whole. And I think if anything, that's the message I want to leave you with. And I, as an Aries, I'm going to have to work exceptionally hard to remember it doesn't matter about me at all. It matters about the bigger picture, the bigger group. And that's what I want to leave you with on this video. Thank you for watching and I look forward to being here again in a couple of weeks time. Bye for now.